Dr. Richard Andrews has been a part of the Houston Oasis movement for a long time. Uh, he's always been a, a strong supporter. His talk today is entitled, Whoa! <laughs> 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 I'm taking up too much of his time. One day in med school, understanding what the doctor said. Here's Richard Andrews. I um, like to teach, so uh, I, that's one of the joys I have with patients is uh, uh, teaching them about their conditions because medical stuff can be kind of complicated. But I think there's nearly always a way of simplifying it and making it easier to understand. In fact, a lot of it really is just jargon, you know, the the specialized vocabulary of a particular discipline. Um, so I call it one day med school um, and uh, 20 minute lessons, a series of 20 minute lessons, uh, and since there's 24 hours in a day, um, it'll be about 72 lessons. Um, I've asked Mike to give me 71 more consecutive uh, <laughs> sessions, but that didn't go over very well. <laughs> So all together, it'll take about six years, I think, to complete medical school. You know what? It's shorter to go through the regular medical school. So I do recommend that instead. So let's see here. Let me get started on the slideshow. Now, why does that not look right? How does it show up? So, um, a little bit about my own background, so you know who's talking to you. Uh, I majored in uh, geography because it was interesting, uh, so that should give you confidence about <coughs> my topic today. Uh, and um, I got a, my medical degree from the University of Connecticut. Um, one of the things I was attracted to when I, I applied to a few different schools, and but one of the things that attracted me to that one not only was it the least expensive because I was a Connecticut resident, uh, but also they made it clear that going to class was optional. Now there were a few classes that you had to go to, you'll be happy to know that I did have to go to anatomy class and do the dissection. <clears throat> and, but apart from that, as long as you pass the periodic exams, uh, particularly the end of year comprehensive exam, they didn't care how you acquired the knowledge as long as you demonstrated that you had acquired the knowledge. And like, like I say, there were a few classes that were mandated. <clears throat> so I found, after spending a lot of time in class with lectures that were some, lecturers that were sometimes good and sometimes mediocre, that I, and, and I spent all day in there, very long days, very complicated stuff, sometimes, well, not sometimes, almost always daydreaming, uh, and either taking no notes or taking verbatim notes, uh, neither one seemed to make much difference. And then you were expected to read the thick syllabus and the textbook readings, and sometimes there was there was a commercial note service that you could pay for where somebody else took the notes for you. Uh, you know, to put it mildly, the amount of material was mind-boggling. Um, <clears throat> so I decided if I chose a well-written textbook, it was well-written every time I went to the textbook, and I could spend my time in the library and, uh, and then go play ping-pong with my classmates in between during the breaks. And so uh, that should give you confidence also that I didn't go to class during medical school. <laughs> so I went to uh, family medicine residency at Georgetown University, uh, preventive medicine residency uh, in Baltimore, and then I did some additional training uh, in uh, weight management medicine. I had a private office for a while in, um, in Virginia where I did that. Um, but I've basically been in family medicine and public health for about uh, 25 years. Uh, like I said, there's, uh, this is a degree granting program. Uh, I grant you that it's about 70 degrees today. So that's, 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 the, that's the degree right there. Uh, you will be able to apply for a medical license in Texas. Uh, you, uh, may, it may take a while for them to get back to you. Um, so, um, and like I said, I, I find that most things are easy to understand if you, um, and Einstein is rumored to have said, although there's some controversy about whether he said this, that if you can't make something simple enough for somebody else to understand, you probably don't understand it yourself. That, that's probably apocryphal, but anyway, it sounds neat. Um, and most medical words have Latin or Greek roots. Um, sometimes it's essentially the same root, just slightly modified. 
Uh, you Believe it or not, you already know quite a bit of Greek and Latin just from knowing English, because there's quite a bit of Greek and Latin in English. Um, the reason I wore a, what is this called? Yeah. A cap. The reason that, why is it called a cap? Yeah. Cap relating to the head, right? The Latin caput. So that's why it's called a baseball cap. It's not a random word. Um, and in fact, some of the medical words are related to cap relating to the head. So, uh, capital city, for example, the head city, the top city. Uh, and, and so there's a number of words that, that relate to cap. Um, cephalic is another word that may be a little bit less familiar, but that relates to uh, the head also. Um, and then, if you break down a word like, uh, um, maybe you've heard of water on the brain, it can happen to babies, it can happen to adults. Uh, hydro meaning water and cephaly uh, meaning or cephalus meaning head. Uh, again, uh, when you break the words down, they become less uh, less mystifying or less intimidating. You may have heard of encephalitis, which can be a very serious, even fatal uh, disease, usually infectious. Uh, well, if you go back to that word uh, cephalic, uh, and then you think about en in front of the word. That means if cephalic is head, then what's inside the head must be the brain, right? So encephalitis literally means the thing that's inside the head, the inside head itis. Itis is such an important concept uh, that we'll spend a little bit of time on that. Inflammation uh, involve, you know, a huge number of conditions in, uh, in, in medicine involve inflammation. Inflammation isn't all bad. When you hurt yourself, inflammation is the body's response to try to fix the injury. So if we didn't have any inflammation, we wouldn't be able to heal ourselves in many cases. However, sometimes the inflammation doesn't know when to quit. Sometimes the inflammation because it involves swelling, sometimes that pushes up against things. We've all experienced inflammation. Um, if any of you have had gout before, then you've particularly uh, experienced, that's perhaps the ultimate definition uh, of inflammation. And it literally comes from the word inflame, meaning to set something on fire. Um, and so you'll see itis attached to a lot of medical words, meaning that something is uh, inflamed. Um, and then a lot of Greek and Latin terms, uh, when they went from, oh, oh yeah, yeah, when they went from, uh, when language went from ancient Greece to ancient Rome, ancient Greece, uh, you know, in Rome they used Latin, uh, and of course Latin borrowed from other languages, but borrowed heavily from Greek, and so a lot of times it's the same word, like hyper from Greek and super in Latin, meaning the same thing either physically above something else or in excess. Uh, and so the, the Greek H often became the Latin S, and so that's why you'll see a similar meaning with those two terms. Again, sometimes when you, if you can break things down in terms of the language, uh, it makes it easier to understand. Um, so we talked about encephalitis. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of neuroanatomy here. This is the, the, perhaps the hardest part of medical school. Um, so if this strikes fear into your heart, uh, I understand. Uh, throughout the first year of medical school, uh, they told us how difficult uh, neuroanatomy was going to be in the second year, and they weren't kidding. So you can imagine the structure of the brain being mildly complex. Uh, and we're going to do it uh, in a couple of minutes here because I know you guys are really smart. <clears throat> Let me see if I can get to my drawing here. Okay, uh, I am not a very good artist, as you can tell. Um, this is the, uh, do I have a laser anywhere? Nobody has a laser. So this is the, uh, oh, no, you don't have it, do you? Yeah. Oh, for some reason it's not showing up, okay. Well, I guess, uh, huh, is anybody an expert on how to make this other screen display on there? So, your mouse could be on the floor. Oh, eventually. So, well, basically, the brain has uh, four uh, principles.
principal lobe, the, the frontal lobe, surprisingly enough, it's in the front. You have the parietal lobe. Uh, parietal is a word from Latin. Uh, those of you who speak Spanish will, oh, those of you who speak Spanish will recognize that it uh, is similar to the word for wall, which is pared, uh, because that's the wall of the brain, you might say, the side of the brain. Um, uh, the temporal lobe. So here, the frontal lobe would be up here, occupying a big portion of this. Uh, the parietal lobe is in this area, literally the wall of the side of the brain. Uh, the temporal lobe is over here, uh, because it's next to our temples, right? Uh, and, uh, and then the occipital lobe is back here, occiput meaning uh, the back of the head. A lot of our visual processing occurs back there. So information goes into the eye. It's distributed throughout the brain. There's a lot going on with vision. But we have a huge amount of brain that goes to the eye back here. Uh, and then you have uh, a tent. And the word tent is actually used. Tentorium is the word that's used for the membrane that supports the occipital lobe and separates the rest of the brain from what I call the little brain. Anybody give me the name of this little structure back right here? Cerebellum. Cerebellum. Okay, cerebellum, since cerebrum means brain, cerebellum must mean. Oh. Since cerebrum means brain, cerebellum must mean little brain, right? Okay, so that is the little brain, it's well named. It's involved uh, mostly in coordination of our motor activities. Uh, and then, um, now the central nervous system is the brain plus the spinal cord. So um, the spinal cord starts here with the brain stem and then goes all the way down to about here. Uh, in order for the brain to communicate in both directions with the rest of the body. You've got the, uh, the two hemispheres of the brain. Here's a bird's eye view uh, on the right side there. Um, and the right and the left hemispheres, uh, as many of you know, for, for some portions of brain activity, uh, now this is not true for all things, but for many things, especially from here south, the right side of the brain for motor activities, for movement, controls the left side of the body. The left side controls uh, the right side of the body. <coughs> refused to help me with uh, the process. <laughs> he wanted to make it artistic, you know. So, uh, okay, on the outside of the brain and on the outside of the spinal cord are some protective membranes called meninges. Um, and um, the, the, you've heard of meningitis. Uh, meningitis, uh, again, is inflammation of the meninges or these membranes that are on the outside of the brain or the spinal cord. If you've had flu or other viral illnesses and you've sometimes experienced a little pain in the back of the neck, although there may be somebody in your life who's a pain in the neck also, uh, in this case it may very well have been a mild viral meningitis. Not all meningitis is serious. Sometimes when you get a stiff neck in connection with an infection, it's a mild meningitis. The meninges are mildly inflamed. It doesn't mean you need to rush to the ER every single time you have a mildly stiff neck. Um, so, uh, but it can be fatal on the other hand, so. <laughs> we'll uh, we talked about the brain. Uh, the brain, surprisingly enough, is about 75% fat. Uh, and the reason for that is the white matter you know, the gray matter, which we're going to talk about, is the part on the outside of the brain, the sort of higher functioning uh, is done out there, the higher processing, higher level processing. But the white matter is also very important uh, because that has a lot of uh, fat surrounding the nerves, and that speeds up the nerve impulses as they travel up and down the body uh, to and from the brain. Uh, and that's why the brain is 75% fat. And there's some interesting theories. I'm not sure this is uh, believed by everybody, but you know how there are different kinds of fats. 
there's omega-3, omega-6, that kind of stuff. Uh, and there are some people who feel that uh, the modern diet, and I know everybody has strong feelings about diets, but uh, there are some people who feel that the diet we used to eat, whatever that is, um, had more omega-3s in it, which I think is likely true, uh, and that that changed the composition of the fat in our brain and that that can affect brain function and mood. Uh, and so some people feel that it may help your mood to make sure you're getting a good balance of omega-3 and omega-6 because it may literally change the function of your brain. Again, that's not chiseled in stone, but it's something to at least uh, pay attention to. Uh, the cerebral cortex, cerebral again just meaning brain, cortex meaning literally the bark, okay, the bark of the tree or the shell if you will, the peel of the orange, that is uh, where the gray matter is. And the gray matter is surprisingly thin, um, it is only four millimeters or one sixteenth of an inch thick. Um, and the way, uh, and yet it comprises perhaps 40% of our brain, and the way it does that is by, you've heard of the, uh, the gyri and the sulci perhaps, uh, you know, when you look at a brain and you see all those convolutions in it, all the, the weird looking stuff on the outside of the brain, uh, if you can imagine a balloon with a smooth surface, if we had a smooth surface on the top of our brain, we'd be a lot dumber than we are. And so the way you achieve an increased surface area with more gray matter on it when you have an enclosed uh, uh, cavity with a fixed capacity is to make those little folds. And a gyrus, gyrus comes from the word for round because it's round and then it goes into a little ditch which is the sulcus and then it comes out and then it's round and stuff like that. And so we end up having a lot more gray matter than we would otherwise have. So, and there's my five minute warning. So, Let's see here, okay, uh, we talked about that already. A stroke, a lot of people are a little bit fuzzy on what a stroke is. Uh, a stroke, uh, th there's a movement, which I think is a reasonable one, to start calling it a brain attack instead of a, instead of a stroke, because a lot of people don't really, know. I have patients all the time who don't know the difference between a heart attack and a stroke. Uh, and a uh, heart attack obviously affects the heart, everyone knows that. A brain attack or a stroke affects the brain. Now a heart attack can cause a stroke because obviously the brain gets its blood from the heart, but if you think of it as a, as a brain attack, and you can learn the symptoms of a stroke or a brain attack uh, on the internet because uh, it, it varies quite a bit. It could be movement difficulties, it could be speech difficulties, or it could be something more subtle. But you want to address it quickly. If you think you might be having a stroke, then you need to get to the emergency room right away, call 911 or have someone do it for you. Uh, because there are clot dissolving drugs that you may have heard about. If you wait until tomorrow or say, I'll go see my doctor on Monday, by then the window of opportunity may have passed uh, and you may not be able to take advantage of that treatment to actually reverse the stroke even after it has started. Um, there's two kinds of strokes. The one where you don't get enough blood, that's usually caused by a clot. My father had that kind of a stroke. The other kind is where there's too much blood, where you have a blood vessel that bursts. If you think of a balloon again, an aneurysm is where you have a blood vessel that is a little bit too big in one area. And of course, where you blow up the balloon, the wall of the balloon gets thinner and weaker, and that's why it breaks, and then you have a problem. Uh, migraine, by the way, um, is something that affects a lot of people. It's poorly understood. But I think the word origin is kind of interesting, at least if you're a word nerd, which I suppose many of us are. Uh, it literally comes from the word meaning half of the cranium, the hemicranium. I don't know why they took the H-E off, but that's what happens with language. Because migraines are characterized most of the time by pain on one half of your head, on one side of your head. Um, the Turkish saddle, okay, I got two minutes. Uh, the Turkish saddle is something at the base of the brain uh, which is just a place where the pituitary gland sits, but I think it's interesting that they call it the Turkish saddle. Um, and uh, the pituitary gland is a gland that governs a lot of things in the body. It controls a lot of hormones in particular. Uh, we really are nuts. There's uh, anything with the word amygdala in the body. There's a few different things that are called the amygdala. And you've heard about the one in the brain that affects our fear and our emotions. 
that word is used, amygdala, when it's something that's shaped like an almond. Uh, in Spanish, the word amygdala refers to the tonsils, and even the word tonsil means almond. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah, so we really are nuts. It's not just your imagination. So, uh, and then we have the ear. Um, I'm going organ by organ, as you can tell. Uh, the, the external ear, uh, you can have two types of ear infections, basically a middle ear infection, which is what babies and toddlers usually get. The external ear infection is more this or the inside, usually the canal. It can be from swimmer's ear, where you didn't get the water out of your ear successfully, or from using Q-tips. I find that a huge number of ear infections are caused by using Q-tips inappropriately. In fact, there really is no appropriate way to use a Q-tip. And if you look at the Q-tip box, it doesn't say anything on the box about putting it in your ear, uh, even though most of us do it. So use it to get water out if you must use it, not to get wax out. The wax is supposed to be there, and the ear has a way of cleaning itself. So uh, I think I'll stop there. I hope that wasn't too much of a whirlwind. Uh, and I'll take any questions either now, or if there's not time now, I'll be at lunch. Thanks for your interesting talk. <coughs> what is that window of opportunity following a stroke? There's a variety of criteria that govern whether you're eligible for the medicine to begin with. There's a few different medicines and the criteria vary a little bit from medicine to medicine. Uh, above a certain age, it's not considered uh, worth the risk because obviously a blood thinner causes you to bleed um, and so there's, uh, there's sort of a risk benefit uh, calculation that's done uh, and it, it all depends. And sometimes it's under four hours or under eight hours, things like that. And it depends on your age and a variety of other, other issues. Yeah, um, a lot of us have heard that if you experience the symptoms of heart attack, you're supposed to chew a full strength aspirin immediately when you call 911, but they don't indicate that for uh, a brain attack. Could you speak to the difference of why? Sure. Well, you remember we talked about the two kinds of stroke, uh, the kind that's caused by what I call not enough blood or the kind that's caused by too much blood. If you, if you don't know what kind of stroke you have, you don't even know if you have a stroke, first of all, but uh, having the symptoms of a stroke is not the same as having a stroke, because there's other things that can mimic a stroke. But even if you, uh, I mean, if you could magically know that you, A, were having a stroke, and that it was the ischemic type, that is to say, not enough blood getting up there, then taking an aspirin would be reasonable. But since it could be a bleed, and, and if you took aspirin and it's the bleed kind of stroke, then it would be a disaster, then you would make it worse. So that's why you don't take aspirin for a brain attack. Alzheimer's uh, is caused by plaques in the brain and multiple sclerosis uh, plaques in the spinal cord. Are those plaques similar or are they totally di different? Uh, as far as I know, they're different. Now, the plaques in Alzheimer's disease are interesting. Uh, the presence of plaques correlates with Alzheimer's. Uh, there's a great deal of controversy about whether the plaques are simply something that correlates with Alzheimer's disease or whether it's actually causing it, and that is not clear yet. But I, but I think the character of the plaques is different uh, in multiple sclerosis and in Alzheimer's. One more question. Over here. Um, yeah, this is a part for a silly question, but um, years ago I read a book called uh, Drawing the Rocks of the Brain, and something that was written a while back, there was a new edition came out, she said that they had disproved that there were the rocks of the brain was for R11, was for analytical stuff. Is that true? Or? I, I heard the same thing because I was brought up uh, and, and learned uh, the same kind of distinctions. But yes, I think uh, now there are differences between the left and the right side, certainly. Um, but it would appear that the, the stark difference as far as the right brain does all this stuff and the left brain does the other. Yeah, I think that is starting to break down as we learn more about brain function. I've heard the same thing. So. Uh, you're going to be at lunch. I will be at lunch. Right, let's, let's thank Richard Andrews. Thank you.